hopes, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. How can I have joy in the real-life battle with death? Because my sin has been nailed to the cross, and the penalty of my sin has been paid, and I bear it no more. Yes, rejoice. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. Let me just remind you, in our series on joy in the real-life battles of life, that joy is the spontaneous and abiding delight of my spirit when my soul is in fellowship with God. Joy is not attached to an incident in life. It's not attached to something that took place. Joy, happiness is. Happiness is, sadness is, okay? But joy is attached to my relationship, my fellowship with God. It's the spontaneous and abiding delight of my soul when I am in fellowship with God. You know, there's one thing that every single one of us has in common. Doesn't matter who we are. Doesn't matter anything about us. We all have it in common. All of human beings, regardless of their race, regardless of their income level, wouldn't it be great if you could get rich enough that you didn't have this one in common? But you can't. Doesn't matter what your IQ is. It doesn't matter what your nationality. It doesn't matter what era you live in history. It doesn't even matter what your accomplishments are. There's one thing that all people have in common. Now, for those three of you that are going to remind me after the service that there is one guy in Scripture that never died, I'm aware of that. Not all of us get to walk with God, and then we aren't, okay? But there is one guy in the Old Testament that the Scripture says was translated, okay? Yes, I know that. But other than that, other than that, Regardless of who we are, there's one thing that we have in common, and it's death. And death is not a real exciting subject to us. As a matter of fact, I would guess that many of us have never heard a sermon on the subject of death before. Heaven, yes. Okay, we like to talk about good things, but death isn't really a good thing in our minds. And interestingly enough, death is something that we are all curious about, but few of us like to talk about it. I have a very, very dear friend, as a matter of fact, a, a cancer survivor. And she spent a period of her time selling pre-sold funerals. Now, I don't know how many of you have a pre-sold funeral. It's really not a bad idea. I don't have one, okay? Okay. But it's not a bad idea, and basically what you do is you get to plan your funeral today, and you get to lock in today's price, and you pay for it, and whenever the day comes, it's all taken care of. I will tell you from my own experience, one of the hardest things in dealing with the death is meeting um, in the funeral home with the mortician and making plans. I remember the day that I found myself most engaged in that episode was a very, very hard time. I just broke down and cried. They all had to wait for me to get over that episode, okay, so that we could go on with the plans. Death is not an easy subject. Romans tells us that the wages of sin is death. And every man, woman, and child, every person ever born on this earth is one day going to face death of the physical body. As a matter of fact, the statistics tell us that 105 people die every minute. 6,305 people every single hour. 152,000 people every day. Now, wouldn't you think, with that much death around us, that we could get used to it, and it wouldn't be such a tough issue for us? And yet, with death all around us, Though we experience it regularly on this earth 150,000 times a day, it's unpleasant, it's difficult, and it's something that we don't like to think about. Ladies, 10 out of 11 of you will become widows. Men and women? Yeah, 10 out of 10 of you are going to die. Those are the statistics. 
Paul writes on the subject of rejoicing in death in Philippians. We've looked at, in our study, we've looked at um, joy and loneliness and joy and suffering. Today we come to the subject of joy and death. Paul finds himself in jail, on trial for his life. The emperor under whom he's being tried is the ruthless Nero, um, one of the Caesars, and one of the most ruthless of all of the Caesars who detested Christianity. And Paul is in trial under his administration. He is separated from his friends, so he is alone. He knows that his fate may be that he is going to be put to death. Now, he is released from prison, but re-arrested and dies within a very um, few years of the time of writing this. Okay, A short time later, he's re-arrested and eventually put to death. But in the midst of facing death, in the midst of this real-life battle, Paul says, there are reasons to rejoice. And so, Philippians chapter 1, would you turn there with me and stand together as we read the word? Philippians chapter 1, I'd like to begin reading in verse 19. But if you have your Bible open, and if you have the New International Version like I do, um, you'll notice that the New International Version has a paragraph partway through uh, verse 18. And, and it begins, yes, I will continue to rejoice. Okay, Paul has just finished the subject of joy and suffering. And if you look back midway through verse 18, he says, the important thing is, in every way, whether false or true motives, Christ is preached. Then it says, after the word preached, rejoice. But it doesn't have that in our translations. Three times in verse 18, Paul uses the word rejoice. So it reads the way Paul wrote it like this. Rejoice, and because of this, I rejoice. So he's looking back and saying, because of his sufferings, rejoice. And because of that, I'm going to rejoice. And then he says, yes, and I'm going to keep on rejoicing as he looks ahead at his new subject, the subject of death. Verse 19, for I know that through your prayers and the help given by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage, so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I'm going to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it's more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain, and I continue with all of you for your progress. I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you again, your joy in Christ Jesus will overflow on account of me. Whatever happens, whether I live or I die, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, contending as one man for the faith of the gospel, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for him, since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. Heavenly Father, as we approach this scripture beginning today, and this, the subject of death, Father, I pray that in you and in your presence, that we might find joy and peace, knowing that for those who are in Christ Jesus, it is well, it is well with my soul. Amen. Thank you. you. may be seated. Do you remember the very first death that you ever encountered in life? I do. I was very, very young, and it was my grandpa Charlie. And my grandpa Charlie was really a step-grandfather. I didn't know that at the time. And I loved him dearly. I loved him with all of my heart. Those of you that have heard me preach over the time um, have heard me refer to Charlie in one way or another because in 1958, I got a train set for a Christmas present, and I still have that at home and enjoy it, okay? 
And it was my grandpa Charlie that showed me how to use that train set. And I remember to this very day, back in 1958, sitting down under the Christmas tree and learning from him how to make it go forward and how to make it go backward and how to do all kinds of things with it that I enjoyed so much. 1961, not long after that, he died. I was a very young boy at the time. And it was the first death that I experienced. As a matter of fact, my grandpa Charlie, who loved my mother with a tremendous passion, um, was her stepfather, uh, died on my mother's birthday. And I remember that as a little boy, how sad of a day. It, it started out to be a happy day. It was mom's birthday, and it ended up being a sad day because Grandpa Charlie was gone. And after my grandfather in 1961, the de next death that I experienced wasn't for quite a long time. It was um, a grandmother in 1973, and then my second grandmother in 1975, and then my second grandfather in 1985, and then my very best friend in 1987 that had actually flew into Kodiak, Alaska to preach for me while I was on vacation and on his way home he died in a plane crash. And then in 2002 my father passed away. I remember thinking I'm not ready to not have a father. And my father passed away on an operating table with heart surgery. And then in 2006, my wife died in a car accident right here in Texas, and in 2010, my mother passed away. And it's interesting, I never really thought about it until I put this list together, that the older you get, the longer the list gets. This doesn't even include friends, you know, friends and acquaintances. It doesn't include so many people that were precious and dear to me um, in church ministry, people that I was close to, people that prayed for me. But as, as the older you get, the more you deal with death, the more you see it, the more more you endure it, the more you experience that real life battle of dealing with death because it's a very, very real thing. I have a desire. I don't know that I'm going to get my desire, but one of my greatest desires is to die with grace and dignity. If I, if I could plan it my own way, I would just crawl into bed one night and die and never know. Now, I'm not sure that that's a, a real great thing for my wife. Although sometimes she, I think she thinks I'm dead anyway, okay, in the middle of the night. <clears throat> but, but, but at least, that, I mean, wouldn't that be a peaceful going? My mother died in her sleep. My father died while he was under anesthesia in the hospital room. Um, many, many of my relatives um, had the fortune of dying while they were sleeping. And at least, at least, whether I'm awake or dead, I would like to die with grace and, and dignity. I, I've made that a prayer, actually. Unfortunately, you don't get to pick how and when you die. But I want to love and cherish people until my very last breath. You know, I would love to not have Alzheimer's. I would love to not have some kind of a senility. I would just not love, love not to lose my facility, my faculties. I was talking to the Romanians. You know, the Romanians that meet in our church on now on Thursday night and Sunday night. Precious, precious, precious group of believers. And I don't know if you know this about them, but many of them have a, um, a home health care assisted living that they operate out of their houses. And every single person, I was talking to one of them this week about this very thing, every single person that they bring into their home, they bring into their home to help them die. Now, some of them, it's, it's a matter of a few weeks, some a few months, and some a few years, maybe five years at the very, very most. But they minister to these people and care for them day in and day out in, 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 the, uh, in the final chapter of their life. It's their ministry. And I was talking to one of them and said, you know, if, if I come one day and I'm your patient, okay, be patient with me. And, um, and if, if I lose my mind and I'm saying nasty things to you, please forgive me. And he said, you know, that happens to us all the time. We understand. We understand. Things change in a person. There's the frustrations of all that they're going through, and there's all kinds of disconnects in their wiring system. And he said, none of that is taken personally. It's just part of that aging and dying process. And there's such tender, compassionate, loving people. So if I have to die somewhere, I hope I can, and, and, and not at home, you know, I hope I can die in in that kind of a setting. Well, as we look at this passage of scripture, I got to tell you, I got to warn you here, I haven't preached in two weeks. So my sermon went from like three points to eight points. <laughs> and I'm not going to make it this week. We're not going to make it through. But Paul 
talks about all these reasons to rejoice in this passage of scripture. We're only going to concentrate on the first three, so you don't need to really care about that list, but we'll come back to this next week for sure. I don't know if I'm going to finish next week, but we'll try to finish it up. But, but Paul is giving us three reasons that we can rejoice when the end of our life comes. And the end of our life will come. Number one, is we can rejoice in the precepts of the Lord. As a matter of fact, folks, I'm only going to concentrate on verse 19 today. And I'm going to take verse 19 as it appears in the Greek, or the order that it appears in the Greek, and not the order that appears in the English, because they've turned it around a little bit. But the very first thing Paul says, writes in the Greek, in verse 19, is I know that this will turn out for my deliverance. It's a promise. It's a precept that he is building this on. I know that this is going to turn out for my deliverance. Paul is in prison. Paul is facing a death penalty. Paul has violated something that Nero finds detestable in his administration. Paul has turned away from the gods of Nero, and the primary god of Nero was, do you remember who it was? Nero. Okay, he saw himself as the Lord, and Paul said, you're not the Lord, Jesus is my Lord. And so Paul, in Nero's mind, had committed treason, treason worthy of death. And Paul writes to the church at Philippi and says, I know, I know that this is going to turn out for my deliverance. The word no, I know. If you were here when I preached through 1 John, you remember that we looked at that in 1 John 3, 1. It's the word translated there, behold. Here it's the word translated no, okay? When a sentence begins with the word I do, it means behold, means pay attention, means discover, examine, observe. If you are familiar with the old King James and you remember the Gospels and there's verses maybe you memorized as a child from the King James that begin, verily, verily, I say unto thee. It's the word I do, I do, okay? Verily, verily, I say this, behold, behold. Look, look, surely, surely, some translations write, okay? But when the word I do appears mid-sentence, it means to know something with certainty. And Paul is talking about this mid-sentence. He's using it in that aspect, okay? He's saying, for this is the thing I know. I know. I am certain of this, that this is going to turn out for my deliverance. I know it. Paul, interestingly enough, in this verse, is quoting the Old Testament. He's quoting Job. It's an exact quote out of Job, where in Job chapter 13 and verse 16, Job writes, indeed, this will turn out for my deliverance. And Paul takes that verse out of the Old Testament and claims it for himself. He's laying hold of the word of God as his foundation, as his security, as his cause for joy and reason to rejoice. He lays hold of the word of God. As a young man in the ministry in the upper Midwest, Minnesota, in my very, very first church, I had many, many elderly people um, in my church, and eventually many of them would make it into the nursing home. And so one of my duties um, every, well, I mean, it wasn't a duty somebody assigned me. It was something I did, was to go to the nursing home and to sit with those dear old saints and read the word to them. You know that they hungered, they hungered for the word. It, 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 was, an, it was just an insatiable appetite that they had to hear the word because they found it so comforting at this stage of their life. They wanted, they wanted to know what God's word had to say, and they knew, they knew what God's word had to say. They wanted to hear it over and over again. They wanted the promises. They loved uh, Psalm 23. They loved Revelation 20 and 21 and 22. Um, they loved those passages that talked about things eternal, things to come, the presence of the Lord Jesus. It was comforting to them. Paul, in his time of facing death, goes back into the Old Testament, lays hold of the words of God, the words of Job, and says, this will turn out for my deliverance. Now, now we're going to come back to, was he talking about that he was going to be able to get out of prison? Uh, what, exactly what he was talking about. No, no. Paul is saying, no matter how this turns out, no matter what, I'm going to be delivered. It's the wonder of dying in Christ. Death is not the end of anything. It's the beginning of all things. 
it is deliverance for the child of God. You see, the word of God is our support and our joy in death. It is our assurance and it is our truth in death. And Paul had earlier written, for we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and are called according to his purpose in Romans 8, 28. All things. Now Paul is not setting that truth aside, folks. I mean, sometimes, sometimes we're really good at knowing the truth until it applies to us. See, I'm really good at applying the truth to Dylan. <laughs> Because it's not my problem. And so I can just say, have faith, bro. God's going to be with you. And then things don't turn out the way we were thought, thought they were going to. And, well, it was Dylan. <laughs> it wasn't me, you know. So and then, and then the next thing, Robert Scaletti and I come along. Robert, it's going to be okay. Have faith, okay. Easy to say when it's the other guy. Paul has said, I know that, that all things work together for good to those that love God and are called according to his purpose. And now Paul is laying claim to that truth for himself, not for others, for himself. Deliverance. I know with certainty that I will be delivered. Soteria is the Greek word from which we get our word salvation today, okay? What is Paul talking about he's going to be saved from? Well, there are some commentators that believe that Paul is saying, I'm going to be saved from sin and death. In other words, that he had eternal security. Well, Paul had been saved from eternal death. That already had happened. Paul doesn't have to say, I know that I will, because he has already been saved through faith in Christ Jesus. Some commentators think that he's saying he's going to be vindicated before Caesar and delivered from execution, but there's a conflict with that thought in verse 20. Because in verse 20 he says, whether I live or I die. So while he has a feeling it's going to go one way, he knows it can go either way, and he's not talking about being delivered from um, his sins eternally, because that's already happened. He's not talking about being delivered from Nero because it can go either way. Paul is saying, I can only win. I can only win. Whether by life or by death, I can only win. He later says, for me to live is Christ, to die is better yet. I often liken it, and it's a very poor illustration, but I liken life to living in a Motel 6. Boy, I like it. Never stayed anywhere else, just the Motel 6. Hey, they have a pool. And free breakfast. And I one day find out you got to leave the Motel 6. I don't want to leave the Motel 6. I, somebody changes my sheets every day. This is a great spot. And I find out that I have to move into the Hilton. Wow. I've never been in the Hilton. <laughs> and I thought the Motel 6 was good. This earth is like the Motel 6, folks. And it's all we know. And we think we have it so great. And Paul is saying, oh, no, 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 no. There's a heavenly Hilton. And I can only win. Whether I live, it's good. If I die, it's gooder. Again, let's hear from Job. Beautiful verses in Job 19, 25 to 27. Job says, I know that my Redeemer lives. And that in the end, he will stand upon this earth. And when I awake, after this body has been destroyed, I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes. I, not another. Oh, how my heart yearns within me for this day. The precepts of the Lord are right and true. And the precepts of the Lord bring confidence and peace to us as we deal with the real life battle of death. 
then Paul goes on to a second thing. And he talks about the prayers of the saints. He says, he says, I know that I'm going to be delivered. And then he says, through your prayers, through your prayers. You see, Paul believed in the limitless power of God to deliver for all eternity. Yes, he did. Paul believed he was going to be delivered. But Paul also believed that the sovereignty of God incorporates the prayers of the saints. It's an amazing study to see what Paul has to say about prayer in his real life battles throughout the scriptures. You see, Paul writes to the church at Corinth saying that the sentence of death was upon him in Asia, but he was comforted by the prayers of the church. Then he writes to the Romans and before Paul ever came to Rome, for trial, he wrote and he said to the church of Rome, pray that I may be rescued. To the church at Ephesus, he writes, pray for me. To the church at Thessalonica, he says, pray for us. And in the second book, he says, pray that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men. Paul is dependent upon the prayers of believers as he deals with this real life battle of death. He's dependent upon the church. He's dependent upon his friends. He's dependent upon the brethren. Here's the beauty of the body of Christ, ladies and gentlemen. When we face death, we don't stand alone. Being in the ministry, I've been with people who had no one, no friends no relatives, no one who cared other than a very loving hospital or nursing home staff, but no one who visited, no one who prayed. They were all by themselves. I don't want to die alone. I don't want to die alone. And I have good news for you. You're not going to die alone. And I have good news for me. I'm not either. I saw the beauty of the body of Christ, the beauty of the family of believers in my grandmother's death. It's a sad story somewhat because of this. It's my mother's mother. My mother's mother married a man that she didn't love. And she had one child by that relationship and it was my mother. And my grandmother detested my mother because she detested her husband, who she never loved. He died one day. And my grandmother got remarried to my Grandpa Charlie, who adored my mother. But while my Grandpa Charlie adored my mother, her mother did not. As a little boy growing up, I remember looking at and I wouldn't have described it this way as a little boy, but looking at a very strained relationship between my mother and my grandmother, her mother. No love, no affection, no touching, no hugging. N nothing that I was used to seeing between me and my mother. It seemed odd to me, but I never really put it together until years later when I was studying my family tree. Well, in the 70s, my grandmother was diagnosed with cancer and eventually was dying in a hospital. And my mother, who had never, ever had affection from her mother, set everything aside and went to her mother's side and stayed with her day in and day out, held her hand, read the word of God to her, read the promises of eternity. First Corinthians, first and second Thessalonians, Revelation 21 and 22, Psalm 23, day in and day out, she read the promises of the word, held her mother's hand, comforted her mother, until her mother took her very last breath. Now, I'm going to tell you this. My grandmother was a believer. She just had this issue. You know, believers aren't perfect. They're not perfect. My mother also, a godly person, 
And even though she had never been given the affection of her mother when the time came, she didn't have it in her heart to watch her own mother pass without somebody being present. Paul says, I need you. I need you. I'm rejoicing in the prayers of the saints. We need one another, folks, for life. And we need one another for death. Because it can be a sad and fearful time for us. And the body of Christ has the body of Christ. And Paul rejoices in the precepts of the word and in the prayers of the saints and in the provision of the spirit. You see, it doesn't end with just the word of God and the presence of believers. It goes on to the provision of the Holy Spirit. And here's what Paul says. For I know that through your prayers and help given by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, the help given by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. God doesn't forsake you. God doesn't forsake you. We often, we, I mean, we, we talk about, we sing about, um, we teach about the presence of God in our lives. Let's remember the presence of God when our life comes to an end. Let's remember the presence of God with us in our passing. Because we're not dying. We're not dying. The believer doesn't die. Death is dead for the believer. Life goes on. It's a doorway. It's a moving. It's a moving out of the Motel 6 into the heavenly Hilton. It's a doorway from this life to the next. I am convinced of this. I am convinced of this, folks, that the believer who dies takes their last breath their last heartbeat, and they never knew they died. Because they didn't. Because they didn't. I tell people my wife was killed instantly in a car accident. From my perspective, from her perspective, I'm not sure, but I like to think of it like this. Because she was run over in a car by a truck. And I like to think that she saw that truck coming. Well, I actually don't think she saw it coming. But in my mind, this is a picture I have. She saw that truck coming, and the next thing she was standing with Jesus, and she said, whew, that was close. <laughs> That's the picture I hang on to, folks. And I think there's a lot of truth in that. The provision of the Spirit. The Word of God, the prayers of the saints, and the power of the Holy Spirit work together to allow us to rejoice in death. The word help. Help in the NIV is the word supply in the King James. And it means a full and bountiful and sufficient supply. Full, bountiful, and sufficient. You know what that means? It means when it says, it says help given by the Spirit, enough help. Enough help. You ever been in the hospital? And you're sick and you're hurting? And you're hungry and the only thing they'll give you is some liquid in a bottle? And you just want a piece of fried chicken. <laughs> and you keep ringing the bell, and you ring the bell, and you ring the bell, and Willie, why won't you come? <laughs> Willie says, I've gone in there enough. The Holy Spirit gives us enough help. Enough help. He doesn't abandon us. He doesn't leave us alone. He is with us. He is with us every step, every moment, every heartbeat, every breath. Full, bountiful, sufficient supply of the help of the Holy Spirit. Paul writes in Philippians 4, we're going to come to it eventually, my God shall supply, guess how many of your needs? All of your needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. It's a cool thing. You know what all means? It's the, it's the Greek word pas. And by the way, the word all is in reference to every individual need. You know what the word all means in the Greek literally? I bet you can guess. What is it? It's all, okay? You know what's less than all? Not all. All is all. All is every. The word means each, every, any, all, the whole, every one, all things, everything, no exceptions. I put up there Genesis 43, 34. I'm not going to go there because I don't have time. But you remember the story. I'm just going to quickly tell, remind you. You remember the story of Joseph and Benjamin? And Joseph had been sold into slavery by his brothers down into Egypt. And one day the brothers show up because there's famine in the land. And eventually, I'm cutting to the end of the story, but eventually Joseph provides. They don't know it's him. 
they don't know it's their brother that they sold. And eventually Joseph invites them to a dinner in the royal mansion, and they all come in, they sit down at this table, and the food's brought in. And one of the brothers is his full brother, same father, same mother, okay? The rest are half-brothers. And for his full brother, there's a plate of food is put by each brother all the way down the line. Benjamin's the youngest. They come to Benjamin, and he gets this heaping, heaping um, a plate of food, five times as much food. Imagine if you go out to lunch today, and guys, you get your plate of food, and your wife gets this heaping. And you're wondering, well, what did she do to get so much, okay? That's the way it is. An abundant supply was given to Benjamin. That's what the Holy Spirit has for us, an abundant supply of help, of presence, of joy, of peace in the hour of death. Now, let me say this. doesn't mean we're not sad. Because sadness, like happiness, is based on a circumstance. When my father died, and I might talk more about this next week, but when my father died, he called me up and told me he was going to die. My grandfather, I sat down with my grandfather, and my grandfather said to me, Russell, I'm going to die. I believed my grandfather. When my father called me up, and I was in Alaska, and he said, Russell, I'm going to die. No, I was in California. I can't, can't remember what happened. He called me up and he said, I'm going to die. And he died the next day, and I didn't believe him. My grandfather told me he was going to die. My dad told me he was going to die. I was always mad at my mom because she didn't warn me. But when my dad told me, I could hear the sadness in his voice. It was, it was right before Super Bowl Sunday, and I said, no, Dad. Sunday we're going to talk about the game call the refs all bad names. But he didn't make it. And he was sad. What was he sad about? Oh, he knew Jesus as his Savior, folks. He knew he was going to heaven. He was sad because he was leaving me and mom and my sister. You see, death doesn't mean there isn't sadness. But death doesn't erase joy. Because joy isn't based on a circumstance. It's based on a relationship with God. So sadness and joy are not mutually exclusive of each other. We can rejoice in death because of the truth of the precepts of God and the prayers of the saints and the provision of the Spirit. And that doesn't mean that we won't be sad. It doesn't mean we won't cry. It doesn't mean that we won't regret leaving the Motel 6 and the friends we made. But those in Christ Jesus we will see again it means in the midst of it all, we can say it is well, it is well with my soul. We sang that song this morning, written by Horatio Spafford, it is well, it is well with my soul. Few people have known death, as did Horatio Spafford. I want to share his story. Horatio Spafford was a man familiar with death and tragedy. The Spaffords were grieving over the death of their first son to scarlet fever when the great Chicago fire decimated the city. Horatio, a successful lawyer and real estate investor, lost everything. After the fire, Horatio and his wife Anna were attempting to pick up the pieces when a good friend, the great evangelist preacher, D.L. Moody encouraged him to take a much-needed vacation. Moody was doing a preaching stint in England and invited the Spafford family to join him there. Horatio had some business to attend to, so he decided to send his wife and daughters on ahead, planning to meet up with them shortly. En route, the Spafford ship collided with an iron sailing vessel and all four daughters drowned. Anna was only one of a handful of survivors. Horatio immediately departed for England to join his devastated wife. When the ship's captain told him that they were passing over the scene of the accident, he retired to his cabin. Overcome with sorrow, he wrote, When sorrows like sea billows roll, 
whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. These words were eventually set to music and became the great hymn of the same name, it is well with my soul. However, the story did not stop there. A few years later, Horatio and Anna had two more children, a son and a daughter. But this son also contracted scarlet fever and died at just four years old. Horatio's life was marked by persistent tragedy and death. In the course of his life, he lost business and real estate and saw the death of six of his eight children. However, he did not surrender himself to anger, sorrow, and despair. Though he wrestled with these things to be sure, instead he defiantly declared his hope and trust in his sovereign Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Echoing the words of Paul, he learned to be content in any situation, even death and loss. Ultimately, the Spaffords turned their grief into mercy ministry, founding a small community of believers in Jerusalem working to aid the poor and needy in the early days of World War I. Horatio's great song challenges us to fight for joy in the midst of tragedy and death, to defiantly declare that in Jesus, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. What a powerful testimony. Horatio Spafford learned that the precepts of the Word of God, the prayers of the saints, and the presence of the Spirit was the source of joy in the real life battle of death. One day we will be there. One day we will pass from this life to eternity. But I want you to hang on to this as you go away. You won't pass alone and you won't die. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Oh, my soul. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the power of your word. I don't always like to talk about death, Lord, but it's a reality. But how I thank you that in Christ Jesus, the death isn't. Oh, yeah, the death of the body. My heart will quit. My breathing will stop but I will live on forever and ever in your presence in the wonder of that place called heaven that I can't even imagine. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for bearing my sins on the cross, for paying my penalty, for dying my death, that I might rejoice 